If somebody wants to really appreciate whether I'm authentic or not, they should come to a retreat that I lead. There will be no doubt in their mind whether I'm authentic. And to me, authenticity means that you're willing to be open, honest, and vulnerable, and real. And I invite people, everybody I'm working with, to make this commitment with me to be both open, honest, vulnerable, and real. And if they notice I'm not being authentic, if they notice I'm not being open, honest, vulnerable, and real, they can bring it to my attention and I will correct it. Now that is fucking authenticity. Mm -hmm. Yes, because I've heard, in fact, I worked for an organization a few years back who their mission was to be open and honest. And without that third piece, open and honest could be that, you know, I really think you're an asshole and I don't like you. Well, there we go. I was open and I was honest. That's, I've honored the mission statement. Exactly. So it seems to me that third piece, that vulnerable piece, yes. which is, I yes. think you're an asshole yes. and I'm afraid of you. So, because my father was an asshole or whatever the, this, whatever the vulnerability was. This doing. is really deeply important. In one of the forms of shadow work that I've been trained in, which is Hal Stone's voice dialogue process. Hal Stone was a Jungian analyst that decided he didn't want to do psychotherapy anymore because there were too many rules. He couldn't really help people. So he developed this process of voice dialogue, which is a brilliant form of shadow work. And um, he's the one that pointed out that Transference and countertransference is a therapeutic modality. This is what Jung brought to the table. And Jungians understand this and they use this. And just briefly explain transference and countertransference. It's projection. Uh -huh. Let's say that you're my teacher, and I, let's say you're my martial arts teacher, and I think you're great. I project my Bruce Lee onto you. And then I do everything you tell me so I can be like Bruce Lee. That's a projection. In some of the men's work I've done, we say, if you spot it, you've got it. So if I spot Bruce Lee in you, I've got the potential in me. Let's say I'm a Zen Roshi and you think I'm the Buddha. Now I know you don't. <laughs> <laughs> and I've given you ample reason not to. <laughs> I've never met the Buddha. <laughs> None of the teachers, including my teacher, who I love dearly, is the Buddha. But you projecting the Buddha onto me is transference. Mm -hmm. Me projecting no Buddha onto you is counter-transference. Both are projections. I have to look at you and see the Buddha. You have to look at me and see your own inner Buddha that you're cultivating. I have to look at you and see the Buddha that I'm, I'm trying to help manifest. This is really important. Now, the vulnerability piece. When I'm doing voice dialogue, these projections, which you can look at as transference and countertransference, or you can look at as bonding patterns, these parental bonding patterns that are ingrained in our psyches and our behavior, that come out in all our relationships. What breaks the negative bonding pattern, what breaks the heart open, is guess what? I'm going to go out on a limb and say vulnerability. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. That was an insight, not a guess. It is vulnerability that breaks the heart open. So it breaks that that fighting with each other. You think I'm an asshole. I think you're an asshole. You think I'm inauthentic. I think you're inauthentic. We can both be radically honest and open, but there's no vulnerability, as you were pointing out. Therefore, there's no breakthrough. There's no heartfelt connection. There's no way to end the war. And own the projection, yeah. And own the projection. And this is what's happening in the culture wars that are manifesting themselves. Nobody's learning, nobody's examining themselves and looking inside at their own vulnerability. What am I projecting onto you? What is Green projecting onto Trump? What is Trump projecting onto 
the liberals. That's where the gold is. And I have to be vulnerable to admit it. And in your view, then that's what helps stop the wars. Yes. Both within and without. Yes. So the cultural wars, which are a war, mm -hmm. I mean, they're a war in a, in a very literal sense in some yes. ways. Um, the way out, or one of the ways out is, is acknowledging and owning the vulnerability in my position that I'm holding. And here's the rub. Mm -hmm. The culture war is one culture against another. Can cultures be vulnerable? Hmm. Not that I'm aware of. No. This is where it's really important to understand the difference between a whole human being and a whole culture, mm -hmm. or what Kessler talked about as holons. My favorite quote in graduate school is the only difference between a culture and a psychosis is the number of people involved. That's one difference. Cultures don't have a dominant monad. They don't have independent volition. They don't have a mind that can make choices and take responsibility. All cult cultures are, are grammatical sets of rules like deep grammar in language. In fact, cultures are language. What cultures or groups have a collective holon is a dominant mode of communication. They have a set of grammatical rules that they all follow and adhere to. They have no capacity to make decisions as a whole. So this is really important. There's this belief propagated by Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, the second turning is most likely the Sangha, that there's an implication that a group of people can awaken. Only individuals awaken. Only dominant monads awaken. Only dominant monads can be vulnerable. Cultures can't be vulnerable. Now you could make a rule that everybody's got to be vulnerable, but that's not going to turn out well. <laughs> <laughs> because it's not a breakthrough. It's just another rule that's being enforced and it will create more problems. It will create fragility, not anti-fragility, like we were talking about earlier.